All right, we're going to get started in just a few minutes here, uh, folks. We have, I'm Shancy, and I am the Business Relationship Manager with HomeGage. You all probably, if you attended this morning, heard my little blurb and intro as to how I fit into this little puzzle. And with us today is Mr. Troy Thompson, who is uh, a very uh, experienced home inspector, not just that, but a, a successful, experienced businessman. And uh, he is going to be talking to us today about sewer scope training um, for the next, say, 40 or 5, 50 minutes. If, you, uh, if everyone just looks at your screen, you should have some question and answer up like Q&A or a chat feature on your screen. I will do my very best to answer if I can. If, it's, um, if the question is, is really pressing or really specific to the topic, which Troy is talking about, uh, I will pop in and kind of like try to squeeze in there and get him to answer the question. But we'll, we will stop periodically for questions. Um, and I think uh, that should be about it. Uh, I think that's it. I think, Troy, do you have all, everything you need to get started? Yep, I'm ready to go. Excellent. Well, why don't, it's two minutes till. Uh, if you want to just do a little intro to yourself, and then at the top of the hour, we'll start your, your, um, your presentation. Okay, perfect. Excellent. I'm going to mute myself here, and I will just monitor for the moment. Okay, so my name's Troy Thompson. I'm based in Utah. Um, I kind of thought it would be a good idea for me to give my background of why they've asked me to do sewer scope training today for you guys. So I started doing home inspections back in 1996. I started part-time while I was a full-time plumber. Um, I ended up being a plumber for 17 years. Um, I went full-time in home inspections in 2001. So um, my, I actually still have my plumbing license. It reads Master Plumber for the state of Utah. So sewer scopes have always been something that was always in my wheelhouse and I was able to do that. Um, I've been offering sewer scopes since day one with my home inspection. So I've been kind of doing them since 1996. They really haven't become hugely popular until about the last, I would say five or six years, they've been really popular. Um, I wanna kind of put into context how many we're doing as a company. So I am a multi-inspector company. I have, um, I have some inspectors that, um, that, uh, hold on one second. Okay. Um, I have, I have 12 inspectors. Last year we did 4,500 home inspections, just shy of that, like 4,483 home inspections. Of that, we did over 1,100 sewer inspections. Um, and we charge $200 per inspection. So it added a, and I have a screen I'll share with you, but it added a substantial amount to my bottom line for the year, just doing these sewer inspections. Um, they're relatively easy to do. Um, I hope going through this today that you'll be able to figure out what's going on. And like Shancy said, if you guys got questions, give them to her and she's, I've told her to interrupt me if you want me to answer your questions. So I think I'll just dive into it from there. So we're gonna talk about the basics of a sewer inspection. And you know, basically the rule of thumb, you guys, if it's an older sewer pipe and it's still carrying the waste with no leaks, there's no reason to have it replaced. It's just not really in the wheelhouse because it's such a huge expense. And if everything looks good, no matter how old the pipe is, it really can stay in there. There are a few exceptions to that and we're gonna talk about them. Most mainline sewers need to be cleaned every three to five years of part of, as part of normal maintenance. And that's something that most homeowners don't understand. And when you're talking to your clients at your walkthroughs and when you're doing the inspections, that's something you need to remind them, hey, part of normal maintenance is they need to be cleaned every three to five years. Um, one of the most important things about doing a sewer inspection is make sure you clear the line before you inspect it. So our general rule of thumb is that we do the home inspection before we do the sewer inspection. And the reason why is you start running water in sinks and tubs and toilets and, and showers and all that kind of stuff. You're actually pushing all of the waste and solids out of the line before you stick your camera down there. And then part of what we do is keeping your, your equipment clean. It's, and unless you wanna get into a van that smells like a sewer, it's really important that you keep your equipment clean. So that's, that's one of the things we're gonna talk about today. So we're gonna go over what kind of pipe you might find. Um, there's a lot of pipe out there. Most common, you're gonna see PVC, clay, cast iron, um, concrete. 
you may run into some orange bird, you may run into some ABS. There's others out there, but these are the most common. So I wanna talk about each one of these individually because I know everybody comes from different areas of the United States. And just because I have something out here in Utah doesn't mean that you're gonna have the same exact thing. So we're gonna talk about a lot of stuff. The first one I wanna talk about is wooden stave pipe. It's, very, it's not common, but it is found out on the East Coast. Wooden stave, stake pipelines became very popular after a notable 1883 installation in Denver, Colorado and were widely used until at least the 1920s. Several companies did manufacture wood stave pipes. Um, Isla Putnam installed a flume to deliver water to a, a flour mill in Troy, New York in 1816 using an open-ended barrel connected end to end. Putnam received a patent, patent on December 31st, 1816 and another on November 18, 1818 but no copies of the patents are known to exist. Putnam was the first superintendent of the Albany Water Works from 1812 to 1818. This was the earliest known wood stave pipeline. So, and I know a lot of people on the East Coast are inspecting houses that are still 1800. So it's very common that they could find it. Here's what it looks like, just so you understand when they say wood stave pipe, what that looks like. And you can see that there's two types. There's the spiral bound, that would be more of your water distribution type um, pipe. And then the bigger almost looks like a hollowed out tree and with the iron bands around it. And that would be more of your wastewater um, distribution. Clay pipes. Honestly, this is probably one of the most common that people run up against is clay pipe. Clay was used from 1880 to 1930. The average life of clay pipe is 50 to 60 years. Clay pipe comes in two foot or four foot sections. And why that's important to know is because every two to four feet, you're gonna have a joint. And with clay pipes, it's very common that you're gonna see tree roots and other things come through those joints. And so it's, it's important to know that once you see a joint, you start watching the counter on your camera to see if there are two foot or four foot sections so that you can kind of determine how many feet of pipe you're out, just so you know. Modern clay pipe can hold upwards of 2000 PSI. Clay pipe is resistant to chemicals, so it's a, actually a pretty good pipe. The downfall of clay is root intrusion and cracking. So the biggest problem with clay is we see cracking, um, we see it start to collapse, um, and then again, the root intrusion. So I've got, I've got some photos, um, kind of some different things um, of what you can see with clay pipe. So the middle photo right here where my cursor is, is a good example of the, the clay being broken. That was actually under a driveway and with the repeated frost and people driving over it, it just over time collapsed it. Then in the right corner, you can see tree roots coming in through a joint. And then down here, you can see that the pipe was broken and stuff. So clay is a good pipe as long as it's in good shape. Um, I got a short video here. This is from a sewer inspection. I don't know who it was. This is a video I found on YouTube. Um, I, it's just a really good example of what can happen with clay and what you're actually going to see when you're running a sewer. So I've got a, I've got a few videos in here, but, and they're all pretty relevant. So I'm going to go ahead and push play, and we're going to watch this one. The music's horrible, so don't pay attention to that. But you can see as he's going through this pipe, the cracking and the collapse of what's going on with this clay pipe. You can see here that the joint's starting to come apart. You can see the lip. If that's on the bottom of the pipe, that can really cause problems. That can cause damming and stuff. It causes solids to back up. Again, same thing at the joint. You can see that it's really starting to come apart at the joint here. And 
And you can see this section of the pipe's in really, really good shape compared to what we just went through. This next thing coming up is very interesting. Um, when we're done with the video, I want to see what you guys think that might be. You can kind of see it down, down here in the bottom of the, of the video. Um, Pretty interesting that that is there. I'm going to pause the video right there. Does anybody want to tell me what they think that might be? And we'll talk about it for a second. I am going to check for the chat that people can chat that. Someone's saying a gas line, water line. Yeah, it's exactly what it is. It's a gas line or a water line. That was Kurt who said that. <laughs> nice. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing that they uh, kind of basically drew, you know, push that right through that clay pipe. And you can see on this, on the right side here, all of the paper that's hanging up on that. So that could create a huge problem. And the, the worst part is, is a plumber is not going to be able to run his cable down through there without getting it tangled up all around that. And it's going to cause a huge mess. So in this case, having the, the sewer videoed first was a great option because it's just, it's impossible to clean a drain like that. So we'll just leave it there. It's more of the same. But anyway, so great little video. Um, I hope that kind of gives you an explanation of what you can see. And a lot of times on clay pipe, these cracks are not very prominent. You know, they don't show up as much and they're more of a hairline crack. So you've really got to pay attention to that when you start pushing through clay pipe. Um, we're gonna, this video is a video on roots. Um, a root intrusion in clay pipe and he's pulling backwards from the main. And I will pull my way back through the line so you can see there are some root debris growing on top of the pipe. And on the ground. I don't see any breaches of, of the pipe, but the roots did get into the system. They usually get in at the joint connections where the two pieces of pipe come together. And the pipe is clay. It's called technically vitrified clay. Here we have more roots growing in again at the pipe joints. And although this is partially in the street, it's technically the property owner's prop, uh, problem um, up until the point of the city connection. some more debris. Mild at, at certain points. Nothing too extreme, but yet there is a, enough debris to possibly want to get it cleared out to remove it so it doesn't cause any future damage to potential backups. Again, this is for 42nd place in Los Angeles. This is a duplex. Homes on the property, actually. And this is right near the clean out, but it's in the front yard.
Okay, so that's what tree roots look like inside a pipe. And you can see in that video that they come through mostly in the joints. Does anybody have any questions on clay pipe at this time? I have someone, not specifically about clay pipe, but they wanted to know if you have someone find the utility before you scope or do you find it? No. Is, do you have the utility do locates before you scope is the question from Andrew. Typically a city won't come out or utility location companies won't come out and find a sewer. Mm -hmm. um, they're typically only going to find your gas and, and your uh, phone and cable and that kind of stuff. Um, right. to so there might be a map on, on file somewhere. Yeah, you, you probably have to go to the city and get that on records of where that's at. Um, most of the time, if you can't find a clean out, we run them from the roof. We'll just jump up on the roof and run them from the roof. So that, that's kind of your two options. I hope that answered your question. I think we're good. And let me see if we've got anything else. Um, I have someone who's saying they don't do sewer scopes, but they do have a, a buyer's order 80 to 90% of the time they do get the scopes done. And then Daniel Hall says, when you find roots like this, what is the recommendation that you make? And that's something we're going to get into, but we always recommend to have them pressure jetted. And I'll show you the difference in a minute and why I do that versus just having them cabled out. So we'll, we'll go over all that in a second. But yeah, anytime there's roots, they need to be taken care of. And you need to let your people know that it's going to be an ongoing issue, like yearly, that they're going to have to have that done because those tree roots sense the water. What happens, especially on um, years where we're, you have a drought year, um, those tree roots can sense that water running down the pipe all the time. And they send those runners into that pipe to, to get that water for that tree. So roots become a bigger issue on um, drought years than they are normally. But once they're in a sewer like that, it's going to be an ongoing thing year after year after year that they're going to have to have it taken care of. Great. Okay. Back to the back to the comment about you know eighty to ninety percent of his inspections are having sewers done. You know, honestly, for about four grand, you can get set up to do sewer inspections, and you can capture eighty to ninety percent more income just on your own inspections, doing these sewer inspections. So it's a pretty easy, easy thing to get into. Okay, Shantz, any other questions? Uh, let's see, we've got Ricardo wanting to know, have you ever gotten your scope tool stuck? <laughs> yeah, absolutely we have. Um, we've, had to dig, we've had to dig a sewer up to get it back. I mean, it happens. What had happened is there had been a pipe separation and our camera fell down into this, into basically the, the hole that it had created from years and years of that sewer being broken. And we, I mean, we were there when they dug it up to recover our camera. So luckily it was a big enough deal that we didn't have to pay for it, but yeah, it happens. You can get them stuck. Okay. And let's see what else I've got. Um, I, well, I can kind of answer this one, but you can if you want to. How do you insert the pictures from the scope into the report? Uh, you use HomeGage, so. So we we actually we don't we don't upload any videos of the sewer. I know a lot of guys do. We do have a, our own YouTube channel that if the the owner's dead set, they got to have a um, video. We can upload it that way. But we use the SD cards. Every sewer camera has an SD card on it. And we just take the SD cards, plug them into our computers, and then move the photos into our photo locker to install install them from there. Right, just like you would any other photo if you took it with a, a free, like a um, a point and shoot. Yep. And let's see. Um. Do you, well, I guess this is probably going to depend on the state. Do you have to be a licensed plumber to do sewer scopes? So I've I've actually trained quite a few companies like 40 or 50 on how to do sewer inspections. And I haven't ran across any state as of yet that requires you to be a licensed plumber. Most drain cleaning companies are not licensed plumbers. So it's, it's a really a fine line. Most of them don't have to be licensed to do that. So as far as I'm aware of, no, you do not. Okay, and it looks like I have one more and that is, this is Trent. Many times toilets have been have to be removed or old clean out caps have to be broken out and replaced. I'm wondering how liability about liability and if this is something we should be doing. So 
from my my general rule is with my guys is if you can't get a su a clean out cover off without having to break it off, I'd rather run it from the roof just because of the liability. It's easier to go in through a vent and run it down through the vent and all the way out rather than pull a toilet or try to break out a clean out, a clean out cover. I do know a lot of guys that will break a clean out cover out to get down there. And I just, I'm with you, Trent. I think there's too much liability. So, and there's, there's instances where we can't get down the vent because the pitch of the roof is too much or there's snow on the roof. So at that point, we simply tell them, you know what, you're going to have to have a plumber come out, pull that toilet, and then let him camera it from the toilet out. So there are those situations where you just have to kind of wipe your hands from it and say, you know what, this is beyond what we can do for you and just leave it at that. Okay. Yes. Wiping your hands, I imagine, is, is very much required it's if you're going to do this. <laughs> Um, all right. I there's a few others, but most of it has to be, um, has to do with the running the business aspect. So I'm just going to hold those until you get a, a little bit further along and we'll revisit them. Okay. So let's talk about concrete pipe for a second. The first sanitary sewer pipe in the U S made of concrete was installed in 1842 in Mohawk, New York. This gravity sewer was re was reported to still be in, still be in activity, active service in 1984. So let that sink in for a second. That was a, that's a hundred and some odd years old. Most were installed in the mid thirties to the mid seventies. Most concrete pipes are four to six foot in sections. So again, those joints are important to know. That's a pretty good picture of what concrete pipe looks like. You can see the lip here or the, what they call the bell where the two ends come together. And then you can see here, there's a, there's where the, the, what they call the male end sticks in there. So, um, kind of how they go together. A lot of times they have a rubber gasket on them. Most of the time they just use, use fresh concrete to put them together with. So in most cases, cast iron sewer pipes should last between 75 and 100 years in residential applications. Now it's different in commercial and I put this in there in case you ever do a commercial building. In commercial applications, the lifespan of cast iron drain pipes is 30 to 50 years. Why do you guys think that is? Can anybody real quick think why that in commercial it would only last half of what it would in residential? Okay, I'm getting that. Um, no, I do. I don't. I don't see an answer for that. So, oh, it says chemicals. That's a big part of it. That's a. That's probably eighty percent of it. The other is just more water flowing down at all the time is going to wear it out because water is very abrasive. So it's going to wear it out quicker because of the double use of water running down it all the time. So cast iron sewer pipes are very common in homes built from 1900 to 1974. To this day, many commercial properties are still constructed with cast iron pipes. Although most manufacturers of cast iron piping have turned to ductile iron pipe, Ductile iron pipe is stronger and more resilient, and it's actually cheaper for them to make, so that's why they're using it. Other factors that can shorten the life expectancy of a cast iron sewer pipe. Detergents, such as hand soaps and laundry detergent, chemical drain openers, especially sulfuric type acids. These chemical drain openers may get the drain flowing, but they can also result in weakening your cast iron pipe. This is a big one, soil conditions. Certain soils can be more acidic. Acidic soils can cause corrosive action to take place on the cast iron, therefore decreasing the lifespan of cast iron. Another big one is grease. Grease has long been a problem for cast iron drain pipes, and it is the primary reason for channeling. Channeling is when the bottom of the cast iron pipe has rotted away, resulting in a channel in the, on the bottom of the pipe. And as a home inspector, you guys have probably seen where the bottom part of the cast iron stack in the basement or in the crawl space is leaking and it's paper thin. Most of the time that's caused by the grease that people put down their drain. In most cases, cast iron sewer pipes should last 75 to 100 years in a residential application. And again, in commercial applications, the lifespan of cast iron pipe is 30 to 50. The difference is typically commercial applications will have much higher usage. The increase and it the, the increase is shortens the lifespan of the cast iron. So we talked about that. So here's some pictures of the inside of cast iron. And I want you guys to look at something. Even though there's a huge buildup in there, look at the wall thickness of that cast iron pipe. There's nothing wrong with it. 
it looks like absolute, like that's horrible on the inside. But if you look at the overall wall thickness of that cast iron pipe, oops, there's nothing wrong with it. Same with this one. You can see that it's, there's got a big buildup, but the wall thickness of the pipe is fine. And we're gonna talk about what causes that scaling action here in just one second. So any questions on cast iron pipe at this point? I do not see any, no. Okay, perfect. We'll move on to the, the devil of them all. Orangeburg pipe. Orangeburg pipe was used from 1860 to around 1970. Orangeburg pipe, also known as fiber conduit, bitumous fiber pipe, or bermco. It's basically fiber pipe is made from layers of wood pulp and pitch pressed together. The name comes from Orangeburg, New York in the town in which most Orangeburg pipe was manufactured. Made of wood pulp that has been sealed with coal tar, Orangeburg has been described by some plumbing professionals as nothing more than a coal tar impregnated toilet paper tube that has lasted as long as it has in some sort of miracle, many say. Um, Orangeburg pipe is constructed from several layers of wood pulp and pitch. It's the shortest lived sewer line material with a life expectancy of 30 to 50 years. Does anybody know why we had Orangeburg pipe in the first place? Anybody want to venture a guess? Shanti, did anybody say anything? It's cheaper. Someone's saying it's, it's inexpensive. Okay. It, it all came about during- or World War II, someone's saying. Yep. It came about actually during the first world war where we needed all of the cast iron and stuff for the war effort. And that's where the piping came in. It started around the first world war and it continued on through second world war. That's absolutely correct. So I've got some pictures of some orange bird pipe right here and what it looks like and what happens. So as you can see with orange bird, it'll, the layers will actually pull apart. It's actually called blistering. We're gonna watch a video here in a second about it and what it looks like when you run a sewer camera down it. Um, one of my good friends out in Iowa, I don't know if you guys know Roy Weir or not. Um, I went out and helped his company learn how to do sewer inspections. And he sends me more pictures of Orangeburg pipe than anybody I've ever come across. They must've just, they've got a couple areas out there. It's like every sewer is made of it. And he's just got some fantastic video, some photos of the Orangeburg stuff, but it's found everywhere. We've see, we see it occasionally here in Utah. A couple of buddies of mine in Washington and Oregon come across it, so it's everywhere. So I've got a couple of videos here um, of, oh, dang, I don't know what keeps going on with my computer, of what's going on. So we'll, we'll start with this one. This one is in Spokane, Washington. So you can see as he's pulling back through the sewer, the Orangeburg pipe. And if you'll notice in some areas, it's kind of collapsed from the top down. Um, he's gonna run it back so you can show, he can show you what's going on. So if you look close, he's going kind of fast, but he, right there, if you look, see how it's collapsing up at the top and it's no longer round, it's starting to kind of oblong. And you can see that the, the blisters and stuff on the side of the pipe, and then it's just, it's collapsed right there. So this is a better, this is a better video. It's got more talking in it. And this is just from a uh, camera company. This is Jim Romney. It's clean out here by the uh, front entry. We'll take a look down the line from here. It's got a sinkhole in the front yard. We're going to see if it's uh, connected with the sewer. Here's the clean out. It's PVC, but it looks like it drops in the cast iron. It does. away on an angle. 
a little, little bit of scale there, see it? A little bit of scale. Oh, there's a crack there. That's not a good sign. Turn to the right here. Oh boy. Looks like orange brick pipe. See how the black color is there? Yeah, it's gonna be a good candidate for replacement. What we'll do is we'll, we'll inspect it all the way out, see if we can find a correlation with that hole in the ground. I'm taking a little bit of right, so we might be heading over towards our area that we're suspecting. And you see how you got something there? No, that's just a piece of yeah, those are uh, spider webs or uh, cobwebs or whatever. Yeah, and when you see roots, there'll be no doubt. Look at that. That blister there is broke, see? You try to clear this out with a snake, it'll just tear that off. That's all paper. Paper pipe. Orange bird. It's funny how some of these houses have orange bird, and some of them don't, because the neighbor down the street was concerned about having orange bird, and she didn't have it. I wouldn't expect you to have it. Boy, look how bad that is. <laughs> yeah, wait, look at that. No, uh, that's a piece of something just broke out in front of the camera lens. Oh, I am too. I'm surprised I'm making this progress. You know, I, I just, it just got closed down. I can't go any further. Wow. Let me locate where that is. Go 41 feet out. It's about, about where we have the problem there. So it looks like everything's caved down. Yeah. And okay, so that's a really good video on kind of what happens to Orangeburg. You get the blisters, it collapse. You know, and then on the cast iron, I want to circle back to the cast iron. When I showed you those pictures of all of the corrosion on the inside of the pipe, do you guys understand what causes that? Does anybody want to take a stab at a guess of what causes that corrosion inside the cast iron? I'm waiting to see if we get any replies. Sure. People are feverishly typing. Yes. Well, I, I, I don't know. Oh, let, uh, no, I've got other questions from earlier, but no. Nope. Okay. So what causes that? Cast iron is very porous. So the minerals in everything coming down that start to build up. It's basic, like, basically the easiest way it was ever explained to me by, by one of the journeyman plumber I worked with when I was an apprentice. He says, it's like a fat guy going to McDonald's every day. Your arteries are just going to slowly start closing in on you because of all the grease and stuff. It's uh -huh. the same way with the cast iron. All of that stuff just slowly starts to close it off. It clogs it. I had a couple of replies come in. One said pipe cleaning agents and another sewer gas. Uh, no, sewer gas, not necessarily. Um, it's just the minerals and stuff and the water going down the pipe and um, it just starts to, and it's kind of a, almost like it rusts from the inside out and those, those start to form and then it's very easily to clean, it's very easily cleanable. You put a cable down there with a knife and it can clean all that stuff back up. So, and it, it just all goes back to that wall thickness of the pipe. So as long as the pipe's in good shape, you can continue to clean it. Okay, so with Orangeburg, Honestly, there's not a whole lot of a plumber, a plumber can do with Orangeburg at that point. And as, with the age of it, when we come across it, we just tell them it needs to be replaced. It's beyond its life expectancy at that point. So any questions on Orangeburg piping? Um, I have someone who said, oh, wait, let me get over here. Does Orangeburg ever contain asbestos? No, not that I'm aware of. Okay. And... See, not those just yet. Um, when Orangeburg is in place, do you recommend a dishwasher? Um, you know, it doesn't matter at that point because if you find if you find Orangeburg when you're doing a sewer inspection, you're going to tell them that it needs to be replaced. Okay. And pretty much every plumbing contractor that comes across it's going to tell you the same thing. It's just not a not a pipe that they can even clean out. So it doesn't matter what you're running down it; it's going to be a problem. 
Okay, and then we I actually, we had a question on cast iron. Does cast iron leak from the inside out? Absolutely. So you heard him talk about channeling. So if you have the inside of the pipe, the bottom part of the pipe can create a trough where all that water will wear out the bottom of that pipe. And a lot of times we can see that in crawl spaces or basements where the bottom of the pipe, you can see all the stalactites starting to grow from water slowly starting to drip. Well, that's a good indication that that pipe is channeling and wearing out just there in the bottom. And if you take, what we do is we'll take the backside of a screwdriver and you can tap on the top of the pipe and hear how hard it is. And then when you tap on the bottom part, and you gotta be very careful because you could pop through the bottom of that pipe. If you tap on it very gently, you can hear the difference and know that that pipe's wearing out. <clears throat> okay. Um, that's uh, the only, other, as far as pipe is concerned, um, what is your opinion on installing or applying liners inside the pipe and can it be done on bends? Yeah, it, the new technology, the new spray on stuff, it can be done on, on offsets, on bends, on 90s, on 45s, that kind of stuff. The liners are great, but they do have their limitations. Um, in my opinion, the better way to do it is to take a solid piece of the new pipe and they pull it from the foundation all the way to the street. There's no joints in it. It's one solid piece of pipe. And in my opinion, that's a better way to go because then you don't ever have to worry about tree roots. Okay. And does oxidation play a part in the wearing of the cast iron? Yes, it does. And the oxidization goes back to what kind of detergents and chemicals and stuff they're putting down the pipe. Okay, and then some of, I've got some questions about cameras and a few other things. Yeah, we're and gonna get in, just so you guys know, we're going to get into cameras and kind of what we use and why we use them and what I recommend and what I don't recommend. So I will get to all that. Okay. And I want to I point out at this point, you know, you guys are asking a lot of great questions about what, you know, like dishwashers and, and oxidization and stuff. And one thing I want to make very clear, if somebody has a septic system, tell them it's very hard on the septic system to use antibacterial soaps because the antibacteria stuff will actually kill the enzymes that do the digestion out in the, out in the septic system itself. So it's okay to use a little bit like at the kitchen sink, but it's not good to have it at the kitchen sink and the bathroom sinks and in the showers and stuff. So make sure you tell them that that, that antibacterial soap will actually is actually harmful for a septic system. I have heard that we have a lot of septics where, where we live here. Um, also, we have uh, one last question regarding piping. Many clients use root killers. How do root killers affect the different types of piping? So root, root killers don't really affect the piping, especially the ones that you dump in the toilet and they foam up and they go down the pipe. And what they're designed to do is they're actually designed to be um, um, for woody, pulpy type stuff. So they, they attack those roots and they actually go into the roots and they, they kill them. And again, it's just a temporary solution, but they don't have any negative impact on the piping. All right, and the rest are basically business related and we'll get those all at one time. Okay, ABS pipe, which is black plastic, started around 1975. Plastic piping emerged as a low cost, easy to repair alternative to metal materials. Alternatively referred to as black piping, ABS was the first plastic form of piping to be used in residential construction. And then this is what ABS stands for. And I have a hard time pronouncing it, so I'm not even going to try. But I remember when I was a plumber and we started using ABS for undergrounds instead of cast iron, it was the best day of my life. Um, here's some photos that, I, that have been taken of what you're going to see if you see it in a crawl space or you see it in a basement or whatever, just so you understand what the ABS pipe looks like. And now we've got PVC. PVC pipe began to be manufactured in the 40s and was, it was in wide use for drain waste vent piping during the reconstruction of Germany and Japan following World War II. So I want that kind of sink in that they were using it way back when Germany, you know, after we bombed Germany and Japan in the rebuilding stages after World War II. In 1952, the first PVC wastewater, pi wastewater pipes were laid in the US. PVC pipe was designed to last for long periods of time, typically over a hundred years. PVC is typically in 20 foot lengths. ABS is the same. There's also two colors of PVC mainline. There's the green color and the white color. They're, they're pretty much identical. They're just, the white pipe I put on there was just for an example. 
The white will look just like the green here with the gaskets and everything. They're pretty much identical. They're just different manufacturers. So, um, so I just want to recap real quick on everything so everybody knows. Clay sewer pipe, clay is one of the oldest pipe materials still in use today. Its main advantage is that it's inert and resistant to chemical de degradation. The downside of clay sewer pipe is its porous surface, which makes it a magnet for tree roots. It is also more brittle than some other pipe materials. Cast iron sewer pipes, as with clay pipes, cast iron sewer pipe is most commonly found in older homes. Although it is still commonly used today, the main advantage of cast iron is its long lifespan and strength. A four inch diameter sewer pipe can withstand almost 5,000 pounds of pressure per lineal foot. By comparison, a plastic sewer pipe can be damaged by a person standing on it. Cast iron's main disadvantage is its weight. Orangeburg pipe. Orangeburg sewer pipes were installed from 1860 through the mid 70s. Orangeburg is a pipe material you're likely to encounter these days and for good reason. Made for cellu from cellulose wood fiber held together um, you're unlikely to encounter, excuse me, held together with adhesive and impregnated with liquefied coal tar. Orangeburg pipe was lightweight and easy to work with, but was also weak and prone to failure, which has resulted in many sewer lines being replaced over the years. ABS pipe started to be used around 1975. The average expectancy of ABS pipe is 50 to 75, 50 to 70 years. Both ABS and PVC are used in pipes because they are non-toxic and resistant to abrasion. ABS pipes are easy to install in comparison to PVC, but are also more likely to form when exposed to the sun. And I remember as an apprentice, when we were doing underground, we'd throw ABS pipe and lean it up on the foundation. And by the time we went over to cut it, it'd have a great big belly in it. And we'd have to figure out how to make it work because the sun would basically start to deform it. Um, PVC pipe was designed to last for long periods of time, typically over 100 years. After 1980, this pipe replaced the old version of clay pipes as the go-to piping for sewer lines. However, both types of piping will eventually wear out. While they are estimated to last a certain amount of time, this does not mean that necessarily will. Okay, let's talk about cleaning pipe and why, why I recommend pressure jetting over just running a cable with a knife down it. Before I move on, is there any questions on the piping or anything? Or is everybody as clear as mud on that? Uh, let me have a look here. Um, I had a plumber who found sand and gravel in the sewer line. A hundred year old building learned that there are no water jets that can clean a heavy build yep. up. Is that true? That's true. There's not any, any amount of pressure that's gonna push that out. Okay. And um, being a cellulose product, Orangeburg, do termites ever attack it? No, because of the tar pitch that's in it. It deters them from that. That's why they were pitching it with tar. All right, the rest are business. Okay, let's talk about cleaning the pipe. Um, I got a short video. I'm going to be very upfront. This video is horrible. The guys that made it, they, they you can tell it's it's bad, but it gives you a good example of using a cable versus hydrojetting or snaking versus hydrojetting. So I'm going to, I'm going to play it cause it's a good video. Hello, my name is Dave Schulke and I'm Jim Schulke. We're with the twin plumbers.com. I told you. Talk about and answer the question. What's the difference between snaking and hydrojetting? That's that funny. So what we're going to do today live here at our training facility is actually illustrate first the snaking method. So Juan, can we go ahead and show that to him, please? We're ready. So before we start, I want to show you exactly what we put into this line, which is paper products, root, and sludge, right? which are the most common causes of backups. All right, Juan, let's, uh, let's go ahead and put it into action. <laughs> Up that paper product in there. It actually 
right here. Right here. Can you turn that up a little, Troy? That's up as far as it will go. Thank you. As you can see, the water kind of helps push it and clean it rain all at the same time. Yeah, it's pretty tough, but it's, uh, it's actually binding on the roof. happened is that the actual stoppages, which is the roots and the sludge, have hit a fitting. So the stoppage now is going to take a little bit more effort to go through that actual fitting. That's right. All right. Well, now that the cable's gone through the entire length of the pipe, we're going to go ahead and extract the cable out. And let's see what the cable actually retrieved. <laughs> I'm going to kind of skip forward a little bit so we can get through everything because I've still got a little bit I want to talk to you guys about. So they basically get down and tell you that it didn't do a very well, good job. Have it. It actually pulled out more and then they start with a pressure jetter. Our hydro jetting technician here. What hydro jetting is? Well, it's a way to clean the pipe with the high pressurized water at about 4,000 PSI. This particular one shoots 12 gallons a minute. This is called a laser pointing, a laser penetrating tip. And it goes down the pipe. We will start whenever you guys are ready. So, Juan, before we start, though, as the tip going down the pipe, is the water blasting in reverse or blasting forward? There's one going forward, okay. and there's multiple coming back, okay. which propels it down the pipe and through the blockage. Okay, perfect. Yeah. For this demonstration, we went ahead and installed some regular toilet paper as well as roots. And downstream, just like we did the cabling, uh, they, we added the sludge as well. So... Uh, we just wanted to compare apples to apples so you can see uh, the difference in, in the two different methods. Uh, go ahead, Juan. Let's go ahead and fire that up. So the stoppage is completely cleared now. Okay, so hopefully you can see the difference between cabling and hydrojetting and why it's, it's better to pressure jet something than it is to cable it. But there is those situations where the snaking or the cabling is better than the pressure jetting and you have to let the, let the plumber determine that. Um, this is just a really quick short video that I really like. It shows you the, the power of the pressure jetting. Gosh dang it. And um, I'll play it real quick and then we'll go into talking about cameras. This is only like a minute and something. This is a um, demonstration of hydro jetting specifically for sewer and drain cleaning. This is a close-up of a hydro jetting nozzle. Not just any nozzle but a rotating nozzle. About 10 times more expensive than one that does not rotate but far more effective at cleaning and in less time. 
For this demonstration, we've taken an entire raw dressed chicken and packed it into this four inch pipe. The chicken along with a couple heads of cabbage will give you a pretty good indication of the power and effectiveness of this process. The nozzle, once it's turned on, actually pulls itself into the pipe. The water pressure leaving the nozzle propels it forward. You can also see from the video that the pipe is not pressurized with water. When the water leaves the nozzle, it is traveling at a very high speed. It's this speed or velocity of the water that does the actual cleaning or scouring of the debris. Now, in slow motion, you can see how devastating the effect of the water is on the chicken. It literally rips it to ribbons, and if you look closely, you can see pieces flying out of the pipe. Now, don't forget, you're also flushing the pipe with tremendous amounts of water at the same time. There is no way that running a cable in a line can compare to the effectiveness of hydrojetting. It's pretty easy to see why this process is the industry standard for sewer and drain cleaning. Okay, so that's a pretty good little video to show you the, the, the difference between hydrojetting and cabling. Does anybody have any questions on the two before we push forward? Uh, there, there are a few questions, let's that's see. Um, is it typical to have multiple materials in, within a sewer line? Yes, it is. You can go from, from PVC to cast iron to clay I mean, I've seen two or three different types. I've seen, you can tell where people patch the pipe too. Like they could have clay pipe, patch it with ABS or PVC and it'll go back to clay. So it's very common to have that. Okay. Um, water jets. I learned that to effectively pull the waste buildup of a sewer line, you need to hydro jet from the street to the house. Is that true? A lot of times, yes. They can run it either direction. Okay. And if the jetting head flows 12 gallons per minute, and the pipe is plugged up, I can imagine all the water is coming back at me until the blockage is open. Who wants that mess on me? Sorry, I thought that was a question that you could answer. <laughs> that, that's very true. And a lot of times when the sewer's really plugged, that's where they'll come in from the street so that everything gets pushed back into the street. Okay, and then we have uh, two more quick ones. Are you suggesting that home inspectors often drain cleaning service? No. But the reason I wanted to show you the difference was so that when you recommend, say, hey, you've got tree roots and I recommend hydro jetting, you know why it's better than doing a cabling. I, I, we always 100% of the time tell them we, we, you know, we recommend to have the line hydro jetted and then reinspected. Okay. And would the pressure of the water break the pipes? No, it does not because it doesn't pressurize the pipe. Okay. And uh, this is sort of a question, I guess. I'm in South Florida in our area. There are lawsuits going on the cast iron pipes with insurance companies. I have experienced problems with cast iron on my rental properties. Home was built in 1970. I have had many problems over the years. And three years ago, I had to cut up the flooring and replace it all. I did not have water backup on my insurance policy, so it wasn't covered. I guess that is probably not terribly uncommon no, at a certain point. That whole lawsuit's based on a, on one manufacturer of cast iron pipe that just didn't build it to specs and they send out crappy stuff. And so everybody's suffering now and that's, that's why they're getting sued. It's kind of okay. like the old gray poly stuff. It just wasn't up to snuff. Okay. And that's it for as far as piping is concerned. And you're going to talk about cameras? Yeah, let's talk about cameras now real quick and then we'll get into the questions and answers. So Excellent. what equipment do you need? You know, you need a really good quality sewer camera. And what makes a good quality sewer camera is the amount of lights on the end of the camera head. Um, that's basically what it boils down to. The more lights you have, the better the camera. So you need a pipe wrench, some water pump pliers. You gotta have good disposable gloves because you don't wanna bare hand your camera. You need a good roll of paper towels. I prefer those blue paper towels you get like at an auto, um, auto sh where you get auto parts, um, some kind of a drop cloth, safety glasses and dish soap. What the dish soap is for is for two things. Whenever you run your camera all the way out, we always go to a tub or a sink, squirt dish soap down it and run hot water. As we pull our camera back, it helps to clean it as you're wiping it off with a, with a paper towel. The, the dish soap down the line will help clean your camera as you pull it back. So that's what we do. Um, like I said, it, what makes a good camera, it really boils down to lighting. The more, the better. 
I would also recommend that you buy one that has a line counter so you know where you're at and a self-leveling head. Those two are the most important. What I do not re recommend is getting a camera that has all of the bells and whistles. You just don't need them. I've done this forever and I still don't need a camera head that turns side to side like some of the manufacturers out there do. It's just, it's just not necessary. And the ones that are self-contained units that are like in a suitcase, you can't replace parts. You have to send them to the manufacturer. They're just nothing more than a money pit. It's like a boat. It's bust out another thousand. Um, it's just the same way with those self-contained units. These are the two types of cameras that I use. I just started using this blue one on the right from Inspector Cameras. Um, I actually ran into him at the ASHI convention this year, and I bought one, and I now have seven of them. They're awesome cameras. They've got great lighting. The thing that I really like about them is the camera head comes off. You can unplug the, the blue reel off of there. You can put a different reel on. If you kink the reel, you don't have to buy a whole new unit. Um, great camera. They're relatively inexpensive. You can get a good one from him for about three grand. The rigid sea snake is what I've always used because as a plumber, I mean, I was just bred to have rigid stuff. And the rigid sea snake is another great one. I like those because they're easy to get on a roof if you have to crawl up on a roof. The downfall is they don't have great lighting and they, if you have a problem, you pretty much have to send, the, the top unit comes apart from the bottom unit and you have to send the bottom unit in if you kink it and they, most of the time you end up just having to buy another one. Um, what, it, what does this cost and what can I make? So a little bit into the business. In my opinion, this is an easy to start offering, but it does cost anywhere between 4,500 and 7,500 to get started. That all depends on the camera you buy. So that number can be lower than that depending on the camera. Just so you guys know, in 2019, we did 1,157 sewer inspections that added a total of $231,400 to my revenue in my company because we charge 200 per sewer. So now how do you set your price? The best thing you can do is call around in your area, find out what plumbers are charging, find out what everybody's charging and do the same thing. And that's the easiest way to set your price, okay? There's hands-on training available if you want it. InterNACHI offers it through their House of Horrors. It's $4.99 for a day. Um, Sewerscan.com, which is United Infrared, they offer a $595 class for four hours online. There may be others out there that I don't know. I will also tell you this, I have been, I let people come out here to my office all the time. We'll throw you in, we'll throw you in with one of my guys for three days and we'll do sewer inspections with you. And you'll see six, eight, 10 sewers in three days. And we'll put you on the camera. We'll teach you everything you can. And I don't charge for it. You're welcome to come out. I have no problem helping you learn how to do it. If you have any questions, <coughs> here's my information. That is my cell phone. Um, my, I'm in Mountain Standard Time. I'm, I am up early. I'm usually at my office at 6 a.m. and I go to bed about 10. So anytime between then, I typically answer my phone. If I do not, if I'm with somebody, feel free to leave me a message and I'll get back to you. Shanti, let's talk about their questions. All right. I think you answered most of them in that little blurb about cameras and, and, and products to use. Um, if anyone has questions about where to get the cameras, I know that you had some links there. That's pretty much, those are your best Right there. choices. Those are your choices right there. So someone had a question about, um, about that. Someone wanted to know, and I think you and I have actually had this discussion before as to how, what's the length of the camera cable that you recommend to start? 100 feet. And here's why, because by code, even though we don't do code, you need to know this. By code, they're required to have a clean out every 100 feet. If you run from a clean out in the basement and you get out a hundred feet and you still haven't hit the main in the street and you can't find the clean out, that's on them. You still did your job. You still charge them for the inspection and you just say, there's no other clean out found. You need to have a, a sewer company come out and run that. The reason why you start buying a camera with more than a hundred foot cable, you start getting into the 10 to $12,000 range for that camera. And it just isn't feasible for what we do. All right. And um, I get lots of thank yous. It was great information, really informative. Uh, somebody wants to know, is there a recommended camera head size? You know, most mainline cameras, just they're just small two inch, inch and a half round cameras. They all have cradles you put them in to keep them up off the bottom of the pipe. 
Um, <clears throat> the only one, and I've owned just about every type of camera, and I'm trying to not badmouth anybody, but the one that United Infrared sells, the Voller, I had nothing but problem with it. The camera head was too big. There was always something wrong with it. I, I owned one of them, and I sent that back to them for repairs more than I did all of my other cameras combined, and I just wasn't, I just didn't like it, and it, I felt it was a very overpriced camera for what it was, and that's why I, I started using those other two. All right, and someone asked earlier if you have, if they ever use a combination of of both of the clear clean out methods, the hydro, Depends. just to I guess to save water. Yeah, the, the, the snake versus the hydrojet. Yes, yeah. Yeah, a, a lot of times if the drain's really really backed up or really really plugged, they'll send a cable down first to try to get most of it, and then they'll pressure jet it with the with the they'll pressure jet it after that. Okay. Um, there are a few more questions, but I'm going to recommend that if anyone else has questions to please, you can email Troy. Um, they were nothing terribly, we may have very much have covered most of them uh, because we want to get started on our next session here on uh, stucco in uh, synthetic stucco. So um, Troy, thank you so much. I just always admire you and you're such a great mentor. And I just, I really love the way that you're always willing to help people in the industry become better. It's always a pleasure. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. I Take hope care. you guys enjoyed it. If you have questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm willing to help you. Excellent. Bye. Have a good day.